It's Monday, June 8, 2020. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Paul is stating a general principle about what it means to be in right standing with God. Those of us who have trusted Christ have everything. And we have everything because of what Jesus has done for us. We have what he has given up. He laid aside his riches so that we could pick them up. And the general principle that we can extract from all of this is, in order for us to be rich, he had to become poor. That, of course, leaves us with all kinds of questions as to just exactly what Paul is talking about. We began to unpack what Paul is talking about here by looking at the great white throne judgment that's recounted for us in Revelation chapter 20. In that dreadful account, the Apostle John says that the dead, small and great, will someday stand before God, the God of all the universe, to be judged. And on that day, God will check the accounts of every person on earth. And in those accounts, God has recorded every sin that every one of us has ever committed because a just God cannot leave sin unpunished. If you listen to the day, listen to the day that we talked about that, you know that if we've believed in Jesus, God has transferred our sin debt to the account of Jesus. And Jesus paid our sin debt by being punished in our place. And another truth emerges from this same theme. In order for us to be forgiven, he had to be punished. But there are more books that God will consult in the Day of Judgment, and one of them is called the Book of Life. God will consult the Book of Life to see whose names have been recorded there, and those whose names are not found written in the Book of Life will be thrown into the lake of fire. And if you listen to the day that we talked about that, you know that in the Book of Life, God writes down the name of every person who trusts Christ as his or her Savior. Jesus saved us and gave us life when he died for us. And that leads us to another principle that grows out of this same theme from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. In order for us to have life, he had to die. We also unpack some of what Paul's talking about when he says that in order for us to become rich, Jesus had to become poor. And we uncovered that by looking at the life of Mephibosheth, who was accepted into the king's presence despite the obvious defects that marred Mephibosheth's crippled body. Mephibosheth should have been rejected by the king, but he was accepted into the king's presence because when David looked at Mephibosheth, he saw Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan, a man who had been David's best, best friend. And that serves to illustrate one, of the, uh, one more of the uh, other tangible proofs that come from this idea that in, in order for us to be rich, he had to become poor. And that is simply this, in order for us to be accepted, he had to be rejected. So let me remind you again what Paul has said in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And so far, we've unpacked four ideas that come from that verse. In order for us to be rich, he had to become poor. In order for us to have life, he had to die. In order for us to be forgiven, he had to be punished. And in order for us to be accepted, he had to be rejected. And that last idea is an idea that we'll be unpacking even further today. Have you ever had a good look at yourself in a funhouse mirror? You know, the kind that make you look like you have legs where your ears should be, or the kind that makes you look like you're, you're about 16, 16 inches tall and nine and a half feet wide? They're fun. Can you imagine if those distorted mirrors were the only kind of mirror you ever had? If those were the only kind of mirrors you, you, you ever had, you'd, you'd end up with some pretty warped ideas about yourself. You'd go through life believing that you were the only person in the world who has legs instead of ears. Or you'd believe that you deserved a group discount whenever you went to a restaurant. We've talked over the last few days about what it's like to be sinners and about what it's like to live with a permanent criminal record in the court of heaven. And how awesome it is that God has spoken to those deep needs by drawing from Christ's own wealth. He was rich, but he became poor so that we could become rich. And that means that most of what we've talked about so far has had to do with how our sin affects us on an eternal level. But we haven't talked much about how our sin has affected the way we live in our daily lives. Now, we all started our lives as cute bundles of potential, and for most of us, the years have passed and not 
treated us as well as we would like. I don't mean to say that I'm no longer cute, and I'm certainly not saying that you're no longer cute, but truth be told, in fact, I'm not talking at all about how we look from the outside. I'm talking about the toll that sin has taken on our hearts and souls. And I don't know how to say this kindly, but while some of us have maintained our youthful glow outwardly, none of us, none of us have managed to maintain that youthful glow within because our hearts and souls are so marred and so scarred by years of sinful choices. Now, I'm willing to admit that sin is fun, and I often say that people who say that sin isn't fun are just not doing it right. But I think that you'd agree with me when I say that sinful choices that lead to sin are only fun momentarily, because that moment of fun always leaves behind a scar as the fun fades and the shame, the grief, and the regret settle in. And as we grow older, we have to admit that while we were once cute, we've come to a place where we're not really much to look at because we're so scarred by sin. We look at that inward mirror and that's what we see. But truth be told, we're not the only ones who see us that way. I know that, I know that to this day, some of the people who look at me can only see the scars that sin has left behind. To them, I'll always be just another screwed up human being. And perhaps if you were honest with yourself, you'd have to agree that when you look at yourself from within, you can't really be happy with what you see, and you may be discouraged by what you believe others see as well. And it's even more devastating when the people who have that opinion have a lot of influence on your life. Because that creates the perfect storm. When you see yourself as ugly, and the people who have the most influence in your life see you that same way. Sadly, this is something that many, many people deal with on a daily basis. They can't accept themselves, and they don't believe that anyone else can, can accept them either. When that happens, we all have a tendency to double down on the image that we're projecting. You may find yourself trying really hard to be impressive so that people will accept you, but you're afraid that at some point, someone will find out who you really are inside and respond to that by rejecting you. We all live with a haunting fear of rejection. So we hide from everyone, including ourselves. We try to be more acceptable so that people will accept us, but some of us realize that we've never been successful at accepting ourselves, so it shouldn't come as any real surprise when others reject us. And that's the moment we, when we hit what they call rock bottom. And that's where it's all supposed to turn around. You hear that all the time. But truth be told, most of us that hit rock bottom bounce back into the same pattern of trying to be acceptable until the day we're rejected and once again hit rock bottom, only to bounce back into that same pattern all over again. And after every one of those bounces, we redouble our efforts at being impressive. You feel you have to get control of your life because you know that if you don't, the mask you're wearing will fall right off and people will discover that you are not as impressive as you pretend to be. And that's terrifying because when that happens, you know that they'll no longer accept you, accept you and you'll be on your own. Well, I realize that we really haven't gotten to a very encouraging place, but our, our time is almost up, so we need to bring this to a close today and take the advice my mother used to give me when she'd say, tomorrow is another day, son. Tomorrow is another day. And we can pick this up and carry it further, but for right now, I'd suggest that you spend some time in prayer. As you pray, consider this question. Have you ever hit rock bottom? Are you there or somewhere near there right now? I don't want to send you into a downward spiral, but talk to God and ask him to open your eyes. Ask him to show you if this pattern of bouncing off of rock bottom back into the mess is a pattern that you've seen in your own life. Ask him to open your eyes to another way to do life. And we'll start digging into those in the days that lie ahead. Take some time now to pray and let's talk again tomorrow.